Welcome to Ball and Play, presented by Baseball News Club. We cover everything with a ball and stick around the world. We cover Major League Baseball, to international, Dominican, Australian, to Korean. We also cover NCAA Baseball Division I and softball, all the way on down, Little League softball, to T-ball. We cover over the line, wiffle ball, anything with a ball and stick. We will cover it here at Ball and Play. Please stop right now. I need you to subscribe. Please comment and also turn on your notifications. Thank you very much. And let's get started with this journey we call baseball. All right, welcome to Ball and Play. This is your host, Sesma. This is our first official podcast. I know it's been a long time coming. We thank all of you, all of our followers, for sticking with us as we're going through our technology. We actually planned for this for spring training, but we're starting it early. Uh, you can also listen to all of our podcasts on various different outlets, but this is Ball and Play. We focus on everything with a ball and stick. We Just like the intro said, uh, said we talk about college, professional, international, OTL, uh, T-ball, we talk about anything with the ball and stick. So let's get this episode going. This is our first official episode. My name is Sesma, the host. Uh, Davey Dave is also a host, but he's unavailable this episode. But we're going to truck on forward. We've got a lot to talk about today. Um, if you follow our podcast, you know we talk about pretty much everything. We're going to always talk Major League heavy, but there's a lot to talk about. Right now we got international ball with the Dominican League going on. We're going to talk about that. Um, but if you could do us a favor before we start, please comment and also please subscribe. Please tell your friends. We're located on Instagram and Ball and Play, the podcast. And then the majority of our content is Baseball News Club on IG and YouTube. If you want to lot, watch a lot of baseball stuff, go to YouTube. Um, we're going to talk about luxury tax today, which is related to the CBA. We're going to talk a little bit about Dominican ball. We did talk a lot about the division reviews last week and what teams have to do to be competitive. And I always measure teams in the offseason. Uh, what do they do as soon as the World Series is over? Who's making the early moves? Obviously, right now with the lockout, um, we're not going to have as much opportunity to talk about other things like the you know, the Rule 5 draft, winter meetings, and salary arbitration, which comes up in January. We do have the Hall of Fame that's going to be announced at the end of the month, so we got that going for us. But still, it is frustrating as a fan, but we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, being a fan, I know it's frustrating. I got my tablet with all my stuff here, so I don't pretend to be a know-it-all. I'm actually reading from all my homework I've been doing all throughout the week. But uh, we're going to talk a lot about the CBA because I think it's important to understand how the CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agreement, works. Started uh, The most recent one is 2017 to 2021. There's a lot of facets to it. It's a fascinating contract. I personally read it all the time, all week long. I'm a little bit of a nerd in that respect, but how else am I supposed to bring you guys some information? But we're going to talk about DH today. Um, Tony Clark is in the news. Scott Boros. We're going to talk Hall of Fame and Buck O'Neill. I told you guys last week I wanted to talk about Buck O'Neill. I've had his book. There's a great little section here I want to read to you guys, but he's a fantastic, historic ball player. But we'll talk more about that. Yasiel Puig is in the news. Jack Leiter. Fandy Boys in the news. Nelson Cruz. Harold Reynolds, which is awesome news. Um, each row's in the news. We have to talk about Trevor Bauer, obviously, because we're going to be talking about the CBA. So it's just interesting. But let's jump on into it. Uh, let's start off with the Dominican League. Right now, they've got the round robin going on. There's only four teams out of the six that are in it. Uh, last night, the Gigantes lost, which has Marcel Asuna on there, and he's actually hitting the crap out of the ball, but they ended up losing. Uh, you can purchase this on the MLB package if you already have it for an extra like $24. It's a little frustrating. you got to pay attention to the start times. They don't give you a lot of replays on MLB with this, but it is what it is. It's kind of frustrating, but let's move on. Um, we talked a lot about the divisions last year. We're going to talk about that, but let's start off with uh, DH Talk. Now... DH talk is on the table for the CBA this year. It's been talked about for years. It's, I don't think, as much as a point of contention for fans as it used to be. Um, and what I'm saying is when I do polls or seen polls, everyone's okay with it. There's a few people out there that are still kind of like, you know, I don't want 
the DH, you know, I want to keep it traditional. Listen, there's no such thing as traditional. I'm 50 plus. If anyone's going to be traditional about baseball, it'd be me. Listen, there's it's stupid. The way to look at it is either we keep DH or we get rid of it. Plain and simple. Either keep it and make it universal or not. And the funny thing, it's going to be called Universal DH the first season they implement it. If they do do it with the CBA, the next season they'll probably be like, and the return of the Universal DH. And then the third season, maybe they'll start calling it what it is, DH. But with the DH talk, again, this is something the players want. This is something the owners want. This has been on the table forever. And you have to think about it this way. Listen, pitchers condition different than position players. Plain and simple. Pitchers are not the same beast. They're designed and conditioned to pitch 95 mile per hour fastballs at your head. No, I'm kidding. At the plate. Players are conditioned different also. They hit the ball, fill the balls. It's a totally different, like, sport in itself. So, do you really want to watch pitchers hit? I mean, it's really not that fun. All the fans out there are begging for fun themes. And Major League Baseball brought that in 2001. Yeah, you might not be a fan of the bat flips, but hey, you had a lot more celebrations. Almost every team had something exciting going on. Uh, whether you like the celebrations or not, of Tatis doing his home run trot, or uh, what they did in Boston, or what they did in Philadelphia with the landscaper hat. I mean, everyone's got their thing going on, but baseball is obviously changing. So with DH, we're getting Hall of Famers, Frank Thomas, Edgar Martinez. So you have to, the question is big. You know, do we keep it or do we get rid of it? Because now we got leagues benefiting from Hall of Famers. American League is getting Hall of Famers out of it. National League isn't because there's no DH. So again, is it that big a deal? I mean, think about it. If you're the eighth place hitter, you're probably sick and tired of being pitched around so they can get to the pitcher. Because, you know, part of the baseball strategy is, hey, either we pitch around this guy to get the pitcher so we can end the inning. Or in some cases, they go, hey, let's get this eighth guy out so we can have the pitcher lead off the next inning. I mean, that's just... If, as fans, if we want something more exciting, and part of the CBA is the players are discussing with the owners about how the integrity of the game and how to make the game more exciting, because that's all the players want to do is bring a more exciting sport. But with the DH, you have to understand, let's say it's universal. Hey, we might have Nelson Cruz next year. Hey, Albert Pujols might go back to St. Louis, even though he's like 50. I'm kidding. We know his age isn't accurate, but we won't go into that. But that's the thing. It is... It's, it's interesting. And uh, real quick, before I forget, last week I said something about Cody Bellinger. Correction. Uh, Cody Bellinger was being demoted just versus primary right-handers. I said primary left-handers. Obviously, that wouldn't be the case. Before I forget. But anyways, so think about it. If we have DH, you could have Albert Pujols in Coors. Think about it. Nelson Cruz in Coors. Think about that. That's kind of like... Andres Galarraga back in the day, the big cat, part two. It can make, if you're a nationally fan, it could be a lot of fun. And that's part of the collective bargaining agreement. You guys have to understand. Now they got, they're talking about having a universal. That means I don't think the average salary would be the same as a position player, which it shouldn't be, but that's something they're going to be discussing, plain and simple. So it is technically a position. So what's funny is when these guys, if, Let's say the Universal DH has been in effect the last couple of years and you're a dude at the club with your friends and, you know, you meet some girls and they're like, oh, what do you do? He's like, well, I'm an outfielder. I'm an all-star. Ah, you know, well, I'm a pitcher. I won, I won the Cy Young last year. They're like, ah, what do you do? I'm, I'm a DH. Huh? Yeah, I'm a DH, man. It's a position. You didn't know that? I get paid, you know. Oh, you don't field? Oh, yeah. Anyhow, I'm just making light of it. But um, I think it's really neat. Uh, should they have a lower salary than position players? I don't know. That's something, you know, because when you're talking about a guy with Frank Thomas, it doesn't really make sense. So, anyhow, uh, DH is going to probably mostly be here. There's a big chance. And if it doesn't happen, then you're going to see stuff like them saying in the news after the CBA is, you know, finalized. And if they don't have a DH, they're going to definitely be pushing it for the next time. And they're going to probably say something to the effect like, we were so close, we just don't feel that everything's ironed out how it works. It's not that hard. Just implement it, people. It's really not that hard. Do they talk about the strike zone in the CBA? I look through the contract. I don't see much in there, but there are a lot of fascinating things in the CBA, and I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this. There is a part in the salary continuation or in the salary part of the CBA. It's called military encampment. I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of this, but obviously this is something that was related more to World War II uh, way back 50, 70 years. 
uh, even maybe even Vietnam in the late 60s, early 70s. This is probably something that made sense. But what it is a salary continuation military encampment. Payment of player salaries shall be continued throughout any period in which a player is required to attend a regularly scheduled military encampment of the reserve or the armed forces or the National Guard during the club's playing season. So if you go to war, you get paid, but I don't see that in this modern baseball. One, we're not uh, we're not into world wars anymore, thank God, and so I don't think players will be pulled into that, but that's just something that's in there that I found interesting. Um it's probably really outdated. I don't think it's something you're necessarily going to remove, but hey, there it is. Now, let's go ahead and move on to other news. I wanted to talk about Buck O'Neill. Uh, if you don't know who he is, Buck O'Neill, this is his book. I've had this for the longest time. Uh, I, I love this guy. Uh, he is a player that originated from the Negro Leagues. He became a uh, very famous I guess you could say ambassador for the sport. Um, he was involved in so many things with the correlation of, you know, players being equal in the league in relation to, uh, you know, American, African Americans being able to come over and play in Major League Baseball. He was part of that. He knew the greats of the Negro Leagues, and he was also a great in Major League Baseball, but there's so many levels to this guy about his personality, who he is as a person, what he's done to the sport. Um, I can go on and on and on. He's an incredible human being. Uh, you know, there's once in a while someone really great comes across. It doesn't matter if they're a great hitter. They're just great for the sport. That's Buck O'Neill. But what I want to read to you real quick is there's a part of his book that I absolutely love. And uh, this is something I've talked about for years with friends, and this, this is story comes directly from him. And this is straight from his book, and I'm not going to read a lot of it because I don't want to be in trouble for copyright or anything like that. But this is interesting. This involves three players. He says, The first time I saw Babe Ruth up in St. Petersburg, it wasn't much the sight of him that got to me as the sound. When Ruth was hitting the ball, it was a distinct sound like a small stick of dynamite going off. You can tell it was Ruth and not Garrick or Lazari. The next time I heard that sound, so that's interesting, it was in 1938. His first year with the Monarchs, which is the Negro Leagues. Uh, he was at Griffith Stadium in Washington to play the Homestead Grays. And you know where I'm going with this. If you know the, if you know your baseball history, uh, you should know who the Homestead Grays are and who played on that team. And I heard the sound all the way up in the clubhouse. I ran down the dugout just in my pants and sweatshirt to see who was hitting the ball. It was Josh Gibson. And I thought, my land, that's a powerful man. Now here's the fun part. I didn't hear it again for almost 50 years. And I thought I'd never hear it again, but I was at Royal Stadium scouting the American League for the Cubs. So, again, multiple layers. He used to be a manager for the Cubs. Also, he was a scout. Um, and I came down to the press room, and I was going down to the field level, and I heard that sound again as if Babe Ruth or Josh were still down there. Pow, pow, pow. It was Bo Jackson. The Royals had just called him up, and I tell you this. I'm going to keep on going to the ballpark until I hear that sound again. So, according to his book, I don't know if there's anyone else after that. But I think there was one other person I thought he said, a fourth, but I, I don't quote me. But that's just a fascinating story to know that there's just been certain players in his whole career, and the guy's been around baseball a long time, to, uh, to hear that sound. So I thought that's a fascinating story. Hope you enjoyed it. But let's move on. Um, again, Buck was just inter in introduced into the Hall of Fame, not by the baseball writers, but uh, the committee that – uh, basically, uh, they call it a senior committee or, or whatnot. But this is a committee that after like 15, 20 years, you get elected in the Hall of Fame anyhow. Um, so let's move on anyhow. I want to talk about next uh, is they it's starting to change terms. It's called the uh, luxury tax. This is part of the CBA. They call it competitive balance tax. So this is essentially, it's a predetermined payroll threshold for every team in major league baseball and when you exceed it uh you get taxed and because of the collective bargain agreement that ran from 17 to 21 uh for example 19 or 2017 it was 195 million so teams if you exceed that you get taxed uh as it finished in 2021 is at 2010 so you can see it only moved up about 15 million during that period what the owners are doing right now this is part of the cba is trying to get that higher uh players or i mean the teams are trying to keep that lower 
So what it means is if you exceed that uh, amount, the 210 million, um, you have to pay 20% on all overages. A club exceeding the threshold for a second consecutive season will get 30% tax. And if you do three or more straight seasons of exceeding the threshold, you become a 50% tax. So think about that in relation to, you know, we talk about revenue sharing. We talk about the money going around. This is what they're discussing right now. So when you guys are upset about lockout, they're talking about, you know, the owners are going, hey, we want $215 million and we want to keep it at 20%, you know, the first time, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, it's coming back. The, the clubs are like, well, you know what? I think that's ridiculous amount to tax us. Uh, and you're wondering why do they do this? Well, you don't want one team just completely monopolizing baseball. Uh, you want teams to be, wait a second, where's my dog? Oh, he's over there on the couch. Sorry, my dog wanders around everywhere. But, I mean, that's just, uh, you know, it's a way to keep everything competitive. So, who went over? Uh, this year in 2021, the Dodgers, the Phillies. Uh, Dodgers had luxury payroll tax of $258 million. Tough year for the Dodgers. Some of you can blame Trevor Bauer for that. Uh, Philadelphia Phillies, $214 million. So Red Sox were at two hundred eleven. dollars Astros, 209 Yankees, 208 Padres, 208 Angels, 205 Man, what a $205 million team stinks. Uh, Mets, 202 which I think the Mets are now technically, from what I heard, they might have the highest payroll. Uh, Cardinals 183, so on and so forth. I don't want to go down the whole list, but that's where you stand on the competitive or the on the luxury tax. So that's something that is a big discussion right now uh, for the CBA. Now that leads me into Trevor Bauer. I know we talk about Trevor Bauer a lot, but he's a very important... You can remove his name and just bring his profile file and talk about it. He's part of what they're talking about in the CBA. They're not talking about him directly, uh, but there is an article in the CBA under discipline, conduct detrimental and prejudicial to baseball. So there, part of that is if you're busted for a local, state, or federal law, it allows Major League Baseball to determine your career. Now, I want to spin off on this new subject right now because it's been something that's really getting under my skin. I'm starting to see media out there already convicting him in court of public opinion, already trying to get his shut down his career. And I've seen this on a couple different social media outlets. I'm not going to call them out, but they're saying Trevor Bauer's career is over. I think that's bullshit, and I get it. And I'm not talking about I'm for what he did to her. I'm just talking about people in the media doing that without letting the process run through. Let Major League Baseball and the commissioner determine what's going to happen to Trevor Bauer. Let law enforcement in California, in the county he's in, and what they're investigating determine if he broke the law with this girl. And this gets me into another subject. And again, I'm not trying to make fun of this. Uh, this is a podcast where I'm going to say anything. If you don't like it, turn it off. I really don't give a shit about how you feel. I'm just going to talk about things. This is news. I'm not picking a side. If he and her were having rough sex, which all people around the world, go Google rough sex. It's a huge thing out there. I'm not saying get into it. I'm just saying people are into this. But there's so many facets to this case. At what point did he go overboard and start really being violent to her? But she kept coming back for other experiences. So it's just, it is a really weird thing. But most everyone, obviously, you know, again, it's rough sex. At what point did it go too far to where he crossed the line and, that line that he crossed that's where everyone's pissed at him and i am right there with you if you cross that line and you guys didn't have a safety word or if she used it and you kept going absolutely he should be freaking punished but again i don't know that you don't know that none of us know that because the facts aren't really coming out they haven't finished this whole investigation everything going on with trevor but it's very important to pay attention to because the players are talking about this now this is part of the collective bargaining agreement they might not be talking about Trevor Bauer, but that section, the article about discipline, conduct detrimental and prejudicial to baseball, that's what they're talking about, players' actions. Look at Marcel Ozuna. I mean, he the cops showed up. He had his wife pinned against the wall, choking her with his cast. Again, 
it's like this thing in society where we take a situation and we predetermine it with outside the court law and public opinion and we say well this one's more serious than that one or that one's worse than that one trevor bauer had a target on his back so that's why i think everyone's bandwagging or people are going hey his career is over my thing is there's a lot of players that did a lot worse uh, in baseball history they're still playing the game i mean if you want to go over the nfl and talk about ray rice and michael vick i mean in sports there's people that do bad shit how bad is what Trevor is doing to keep him out of baseball forever? I mean, if it is true he did cross the line, he's got to face the rules that are set forth in the CBA. Whatever the, the penalties and punishments are that Major League Baseball determines, I'm thinking he's going to get a year suspension. He's going to have opportunity, but who's going to take him back? With this day and age, with the social media or social uh, movements, he might not get a team that offers to him. He might end up like Puig, where he's burnt the bridge to the point where teams aren't really wanting him. Puig, Puig's now in the KBO, in the Korean League. Uh, Trevor's not even playing. Marcel Lazuna, he's playing in the Dominican League. He's on the Gigantes. I just told you guys, he's in the Rab Rab Robin right now. So, who knows? This is this. Are these particular situations catalysts to change in Major League Baseball? Are we going to start shunning and just saying, hey, you know what? Social change has happened. Trevor, you just happened to come along at the right time. At the wrong time, you're gone. So that could be it. But again, when you talk about sex, dude, there's people out there that have sex wearing freaking animal costumes. There's people that dress up in role playing. Uh, SM. SM is violence. It's violent sex. If he was into SM and she was, and this was a story how he kept whipping her. How would you feel? Hey, I like Dave Chappelle. If you're offended, turn it off. I'm just talking here, people. Don't hashtag me. Um, so it's just, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Uh, when it comes to Trevor, I think it's just bigger than just him. He had a huge impact on the sport. He's got a huge target on the back because he was always bashing on the commissioner and the owners, and they don't like that. And one thing the owners have proven in Major League history is they love revenge. And Trevor's, they are after him. So it's yet to be seen. Again, I'm not for or against what happened, but it's a very strange situation because you have to remember, she's also tied to Mike Clevenger and Fernando Tatis. She flat out came out and said the best sex she's ever had was with Fernando Tatis, and she slept with Mike Clevenger, who has a family. So I don't know what the truth is because the media is no longer focusing on the Tatis and Clevenger story. They're just focusing on Trevor Bauer. That's when, again, the spin that's going out there, we live in an age of spin, it's kind of pissed me off some of the people out there saying his career's over. Listen, man, if you're going to hate, hate, but don't go convicted in public opinion so it creates a wave of people to not want him there. Let him say his side, let her say his side, let it pan out, let Major League Baseball do their course of action, let the police department do their course of action, and then we can start making a little bit more decisions. But I, for me right now, uh, I don't want to even m make a, a real opinion on Trevor Bauer. Uh, he bums me out because during the pandemic, I was really into him and all the things he was doing in his podcast. Now I'm like, dude, you hit a, you went too far. It's not cool. Not cool at all. I don't condone that at all. Um, but what is the true story? Who is this chick? Seriously, how many people you know that have slept with more than one Major League Baseball player? So is there some type of Tinder MLB thing going around? I don't know. Just throwing it out there. Let's move on. Let's bring back a little uh, a little blast from the past. You guys remember when Ichiro was clutch in the WP, uh, WBC in 2009? Remember that? And uh, what I love about that is I love the WBC. That's one thing about this pandemic that's really pissed me off. I love the WBC. And in fact, before I forget, let me show you this. Okay, the WBC, I love. Uh, Ichiro was the hero in 2009, if you guys remember, the WBC. I have the inaugural hat back in the day, 2006, the very first time uh, when Japan won it. Uh, yeah, I'm that big of a nerd. I bought the hat that year. I love the WBC. I think it's one of the greatest things in baseball. Uh, for us to have international baseball, that's where the sport was going, people. And when we talk about league expansion, 
We talk about the DH. We talk about these things it, in expanding the playoffs, which is on the table right now. We talked about that before. Um, what was it? 14 team playoff, best record, and then AL and NL get a bye. Remaining division winners pick their wild card opponent. Higher seeded teams pick their wild card. Yeah, that's what's being proposed for the playoff system. They want to expand it. I'm for it. I'm very much for it. But, you know, the WBC was the World Baseball Classic before the pandemic. That's where we were heading. And if you guys are paying attention to the sport and why we're having the CBA right now, it all makes sense. There's money's moving upwards. There's so much money coming in. There's so much change to the sport. It's growing and we need the WBC back. We need all these things back. So once they figure out their revenue sharing and whatever's going on with the CBA, we're going to have baseball back this year. I'm a big believer in that. There's never been a lockout uh, due to, I mean, never been a regular season game missed a lockout. So it's something to think about. Um, Kyle Seeger retired this week. In other news, his wife, Julia Seeger, posts his retirement. Uh, he was a great third baseman. And the Mariners, if you get a chance, go to the Mariners IG. Uh, they put a really bitchin' like thank you and goodbye. It's interesting because he was a big part of the success of the Seattle Mariners last year. So, uh, rain, you know, Mariners are going to have to go out and get a power hitter. And again, oh man, I don't want to get into it again, but the DH is going to be such a change for the positive, I think, for the sport of baseball. Now I want to read a little snippet from the CBA again. This is a part of the CBA. This is an attachment. So after they um, finalize the CBA, they have these addendums or attachments. This one's from Tony Clark, who is executive director of MLB Players Association. We all know who Tony Clark was, who's a fun baseball player to watch. And this was uh, from uh, Tony, or actually, I'm sorry, from Daniel Halem, chief legal officer, Major League Baseball Office Commissioner, uh, this involving Tony, uh, sending a letter to Tony Clark. This is regarding security. So this is, again, there's so many little facets to the CBA, it's unbelievable. There, collective bargaining agreements in there. They talk about that, which is going to be very interesting because with the lockout, they can't do collective bargaining, but that's a huge part. You're fighting for your salary, so there's that scheduling. And what's funny about scheduling is they do talk about 162 game seasons. So there's got to be one idiot in the room that goes, "Hey, look, can we do? But go back to 154, or let's do just 100, or let's do NFL like 16." Uh, they do talk about this how many games each collective bargaining but it's not going to change for 162 i'd be shocked if it did but this is a direct this is attachment number 17 to the cba from 2017 tony clark uh dear tony this is to confirm my understanding that major league baseball will make available its resident security agents to meet with the designated players representatives and the club representatives for each of the clubs to discuss certain issues related to family security at the ballparks including and not limited to player and family parking, family seating, and security and family rooms. So a little behind the scenes, part of the CBA is to have security for the players and the families. Uh, if you've ever been to a game, you see where they have the private parking. Uh, that's for the family and the players. They have security let them through. Family gets their own little section so the dumb, drunk-ass fans don't harass the wives. I mean, that's all you need is like the opposite team harassing the fans. Uh, or harassing the player's wife. So that's a neat little part of the CBA that I like because um, there's so much like that. There's so much of these little little things in there. You're like, wow, I didn't know they did this. I didn't know they did that. There's a lot to the CBA, guys. So this is why it's set from 2017, 2021. That's why they're going to need a couple months to go through all this stuff. And a lot of it has to do with money, but the sport is changing. There's going to be some real positive change when they, when they uh, announce this CBA, but it's not going to stop the Hall of Fame. Still trucking ahead with the Hall of Fame which we talked about last week um, on another subject with the Hall of Fame. Um, the Hall of Fame, if they're going to allow PEDs, it should be Bonds. Uh, there's a, And then if it's non-PED, I think it should be Scott Rowland. Why not? Give me how many players he matches up to in Major League history, and you're going to be like, wow, a short list. He's a great third baseman. Uh, Todd Helton. Put up some great numbers, man. Come on, if you're going to allow someone like Edgar Martinez in, Frank Thomas, you got to allow these guys in. And Jeff Kent, arguably one of the top 10, maybe top five second basements of all time, maybe. I mean, his HRs rank him up there. 
in the top five for second baseman, but, you know, he wasn't a fan of uh, reporters and reporters. They had a tumultuous relationship, but that isn't fair to him. This is my problem with baseball writers. If you don't like the player, they don't like you. Tough shit, man. That's that's personal. This this is the problem with baseball writers, and this is why I keep saying we have to change the system in a voting hall of fame. It doesn't work. Baseball writers have way too much power, and more players and teams need to be involved. My opinion, and if you listen to my past podcast, you know what I'm talking about. But let's move on to other news. Okay, other news we're going to talk about Yasiel Puig. Now I know some of you are like, why are you always talking about Yasiel? Listen, you need to understand baseball. This guy was human trafficked to get to this game. He's a true story from rags to riches. Super great talent. Maybe not the most mature guy in the sport, but he's trying. He's good for the sport. Love him or hate him. Do I want him on the Padres? I'm, you know, again, I'm biased. I always give you guys all the information, but if you're going to nail me down to my favorite team, I grew up in San Diego. My family's been there for 90 years. I'm a Padre fan. No, I wouldn't want him on my team. I just don't think he has the baseball IQ I want for the Padres right now. He's a great player, though. He could. I just think he should be allowed to be back in baseball. Uh, I feel like he's been blacklisted a little bit because of his personality and his aggressiveness, but he's not done anything close to what Trevor Bauer or other players have done, so I don't know what the theme is. You know, again, if you're an owner and you're just sick and tired of his antics on the field, I get it. But the guy has a ton of talent, and this is what he posts. And this is why I have faith in him. And again, you're talking about a person, look where they came from and look where they are. He's come a long freaking way. you got to have, you know, he doesn't offend me. He's a hot-headed person, wild horse, but he's good for the sport. He posted this on his IG. 2019 changed me. 2020 broke me which that was a tough year for me got covid 2021 opened his eyes opened my eyes because nobody wanted you nobody i thought for sure he was going to be picked up by the trade deadline i was wrong i was shocked but again it's you got to look at the pulse of the sport obviously they don't want him a lot of teams don't 2022 i am coming back i like that i like that a lot he signed a million dollars with the KBO. He'll get playing time over there. But he can come over to Major League Baseball anytime during 2022, and I hope he does. I hope he comes back to the sport. He's good for the sport. So it was cool to watch this week. Uh, another news, Jack Leiter, the pitcher and uh, Major League son of a Major League Al Leiter, uh, Major League player Al Leiter, he uh, tweeted or he he posted a picture on Instagram with him wearing the Rangers shirt. Now, we know that he signed with the Rangers Um, He was a great pitcher with the Vanderbilt uh, team that won the national championship for Division I baseball and NCAA. It's cool seeing him in a shirt. Uh, Rangers, they've been spending a lot of money in the offseason on players and positions, and we talked about that uh, last time uh, because they have a really horrible, you know, we'll go over real quick, uh, 29th in hitting, 26th in HRs, 23rd in ERA, but they go out and get Marcus Simeon, they go get Corey Seager, uh, Cole Calhoun, uh, John Gray, but uh, if Jack Leiter can come up in the next year or two and they put some pitching in there, just saying, man, keep an eye out on uh, keep an eye on Texas. They're, they've got a new stadium. They're, they're trying to make it work. They're trying to make it work. And, and the Rangers have been a competitive team for a long time. So for them not to be competitive the last few years has been very frustrating for Ranger fans because they're not used to that. But let's move on to other news. Nelson Cruz was in the news this week. He's just one of those great players. Uh, Again, it goes back to Buck O'Neill. There's just certain people in the game that kind of elevate not just the game, but the sport and who they are. And they bring just, they're just great personalities they have in the sport. He's a stud. I'd love to see DH and him go to Colorado. I think that'd be fabulous. But he won the MLB Robert Clemente Award. Uh, He's been given the league's uh, award for character, community involvement, and philanthropy. Therapy, sorry. But those of you who don't like how I speak, I do have a speech impediment. So if you don't like it, tough, man. I'm trying. Actually, in third grade, I had to go for my R's. I couldn't say my R's at all. I had to go through a speech therapist. So sometimes I have issues. Um, he's the 50th winner, and he is now the new a winner. And I think a lot of people saw that coming. They're like, yeah, he's going to win it. And he, he well deserved. So congratulations to Nelson Cruz. Uh, fabulous player. He was up there in age, but 
I think he's gonna he's gonna sign. I would like to see him in the National League, dude. Imagine him on the Cardinals. I'm just saying. Okay, now we want to move on to other news. Uh, we're gonna talk about Field of Dreams on two different levels. Uh, we had Field of Dreams last year. It was super exciting. Walk off win by the White Sox over the Yankees. This year it's gonna be Cubs and Reds. Uh, this will be August 11th. Field of Dreams. Thank you, Kevin Costner. Um, but what's big news this week is uh, Harold, Reno Harold Reynolds, the former Major League player and uh, host of MLB. Uh, he is trying to pull a Field of Dreams game at a Negro League stadium. I think this is a great idea. Um, basically, basically, the Field of Dreams is to bring Hickcliffe Stadium. It's a 10,000-seat stadium, which has hosted games uh, for the New York Black Yankees, the New York Cubans, the New Newark Eagles from 33 to 45. So the idea for Harold Reynolds is to showcase uh, the Negro Leagues. And he mentioned the idea of the Field of Dreams game being played at Hinchcliffe Stadium in, Sa in Patterson, New Jersey. So it's significant because it's a historic significance for the Negro Leagues. But I think that's a great idea. But he has proposed this idea. Why not? And I think this is something that, again, this is Major League growing. Uh, if we can get the World Baseball Classic back, um, I think the Field of Dreams theme is phenomenal. It's one of the most exciting things I've seen come that Major League Baseball has done correctly. Um, I love the proposal by Harold Reynolds. That's a great idea. Why not? And I hope it happens. I really do. Because that's how baseball is, man. So let's move on to other news. Okay, I want to talk about something I know with the CBA. I just want to kind of digress on this. Uh, what makes you proud to be a baseball fan, no matter what age you are? I know the CBA, but some people are like, hey, the lockout, you know, pisses me off. Uh, that's why I stopped watching baseball, because all the drama, you know, I stopped watching 94. Listen, I'm 50. I've seen the collusion conspiracy uh, in the 80s, the, the player strike that happened in 94. I've seen all these different things go on. It sucks. But again, I, like I explained last week, it's no different than any other job. Each year or each collective bargaining agreement, they're going to renegotiate. They're going to read. There's always money being pulled like taffy back and forth. This is just part of the process of baseball. It's always been that way. So don't be all sensitive. Don't bubble wrap your cupcakes, guys. It's just part of baseball. It's We're going to have baseball this year. There's, there's no talk of a strike. There's never been talk of a strike. This is just in negotiations on certain things, like I said, the luxury tax, the uh, uh, revenue sharing, DH, expanded playoffs. There's a lot going on. But what I'm trying to say is to those fans out there, just stick with it. It's Don't get frustrated with the fact, for one, there's no freaking MLB right now anyhow. So I don't know why you're whining. You're not going to watch the winter meetings because that's between the owners. You don't really care about the Rule 5 draft. You probably can't even name three players that are famous off of that. We went over those last week, so listen to that podcast if you want to go over that. Um, salary arbitration, that doesn't happen until January anyhow. So you look forward to the Hall of Fame, and then you got spring training coming up. I'm just saying, what are you really whining about? Um, I see a lot of what I call chicken littles out there in social media. The sky is falling. Screw baseball. Damn players are greedy. Owners are jerks. I mean, I see the same type of uh, unintelligent, low baseball IQ kind of conversations. It's like, that's not how the sport is. That's the truth of the matter is all jobs do this. Even the job you work at, you're just, we're at a lower level, but the CEOs, the CFOs, this is what they do every year. This is what they do pretty much in some companies every quarter. That's every three months for those of you that don't know how it works in corporate America. I've worked in corporate America. I know how it works. I see it all the time. It's no different than when you look at like your annual enrollment for your health care benefits that happen in November. You're just like, oh, okay, my benefits are changing this year because the, the owners of the company want to change it to save money. That's why your benefits are shittier and shittier every year. Health care benefits in corporate America, I've been in corporate America 20 years, they're horrible, man. I got like a $1,500, $2,000 deductible before anything kicks in. So that's what I'm saying. That's the negotiations. Now, when you're in a union, you look at a union job, you got the union fighting for you against those owners and CFOs and CEOs. So that's why you see teachers and firemen, they got better benefits than someone like me working in corporate America because you have people fighting for you. Full circle, CBA, Players Association, Owners, you know, it's all Major League Baseball and Commissioner. 
it's all the same theme. They're negotiation behind the scenes, how the healthcare works, how the per diems work. I mean, everything I talk about the CBA, scheduling, traveling, security, salary arbitration, all this stuff is they're just re going over it so they know what they're going to be doing for the next contract. It's not that hard. I don't think it's going to be a problem. But anyways, I just want to tell you guys, have faith. Don't go running away from baseball. It's winter time. It's frustrating. But you know what? Just get into NCAA basketball and be prepared to watch your baseball this year. I want to go back to the CBA and guys talk to you guys about something. Did you, you know part of the discussion is the pool of money during the playoffs? Uh, wild card, division, league championship, and World Series. There's something, there's an interesting part of the CBA. It's the, basically it's the pool. It's article, uh, well, it's article X. You can figure out the number. Um, it's a creation of a pool. Basically, teams that participate in the playoffs should get money. And this goes back to what I've been telling you guys is expanded playoffs. There's so much money to be made with these network contracts. It's ridiculous. So this is where they talk about this stuff. And it's broken down very, very interestingly. But the distribution of pool... The World Series loser versus the World Series winner. I kind of kind of don't like the distribution here. Um, the loser, you get 24% of the player's pool. And the player pools all types of stuff. Uh, gate receipts, um, all types of things go into the money. But, and this again, this is where during the CBA, they're going to be negotiating this stuff. Because the players are going to be like, hey, this is, we want more. But to me, the World Series loser, you get 24% and the winner gets 36. So it's only 12 more percent to win. I say move the World Series winner pool to 50% and the loser 25. I don't know. I'm just saying, you know what this reminds you of? Seriously, think about this. This is exactly like gambling when I'm in Vegas. This is exactly how it works. So for me, an incentive to win is only 12% more. I'm just saying they need to increase the player's pool. If you're a World Series winner, I think you should relish in all the glory. You're the best team in baseball. And you're only getting 12% more than the guys that just lost. To me, that doesn't make sense. But again, that's just that's just my suggestion for what it's worth. I don't think anyone in the MLB players' pool is going to really pay attention to me. So, uh, we went over the teams over luxury tax. And also, please comment, guys, in the comment fields. Anything that I'm talking about. Um, again, this is baseball news. So, we're just here reporting stuff to you guys. Uh I will probably never get involved in the chat. That's up to you guys to beat each other up or have conversations. This is a show for the fans. And uh, Little League softball, not much going on if there's any travel ball right now because of the winter time. Uh, Little League softball, I tell everyone out there, if you're still playing Little League and softball at a, you know, at a small level, if you're thinking about getting into it the first time, just go for it, man. Just go for it. Don't be scared just like swimming dip your feet in the pool and jump on in cannonball style you know dip your little toe okay it's wet i'm gonna get in um it's water it's nothing to be afraid of guys again i want to encourage anyone out there and parents out there you know help your kids out don't push them just help them out and understand baseball and get them involved um let's move on to some other news now one thing i want to talk about is scott boros now, when we talk about agents, because we we'd sometimes talk about um, Trevor Bauer's agent, Rachel Luba, you know, you look at Rachel and you look at a guy like this. Obviously, the agents in Major League Baseball are beyond dominant male, um, but it's neat to see her breaking ground. But Major League Baseball isn't really, you know, fortunately for her, Trevor Bauer's, you know, got a little dark cloud over him right now. But I think it's very important to point out she brought the highest paid salary in one year with Trevor at 45 million. No one really talks about that because you got this behemoth of Scott Boros. Um, dude, he's got Marcus Simeon, Juan Soto, Strasburg, uh, Anthony Rendon, Max Scherzer. Yeah, Corey Seager. I mean, the biggest names out there. Uh, J.D. Martinez, um, Chris Bryant, Nick Castellanos, which we talk about him. Where is he going to fit? Uh, Joey Gallo, Bryce Harper. I mean, Zalek and uh, Xander, excuse me, Zalek. Uh, Cody Bellinger, I mean, uh, Randy Rosarina, Jose Otuve. The dude's got some big, big hitters uh, on his list. I mean, literally, uh, 
that's just crazy. But the main thing that I want to talk about with this is who's going to sign where. Uh, we talked about it last week, what teams, what they need and where they're going to go. But when this collective bargain agreement happens, man, it's going to be quick, guys. It's going to be one after another, one after another, signing, signings. Uh, everything's going to move quickly. So that's going to be very interesting to watch. Now, if we want to recap last week, you know, we talked about divisions. We talked about the AL East. Uh, the Yankees, I think, are going to be right back in there. I think Boston's going to be in there if they can work on that ERA. They did uh, sign Rich Hill. I'm not sure how much that's going to work, but I think Tampa is going to be right there. Toronto, it's going to be another competitive division again, and we talked about the American League Central. Uh, I think Chicago's going to be there. Uh, Detroit's making moves. I mean, Detroit's been a successful team as of late, so you would think they wouldn't stick down there. Uh, KC, Minnesota have to make big strides with pitching. Same thing with Cleveland. If they're going to be competitive, uh, same thing with Detroit. And again, that division, I called it last year, is the weakest division in, in the American League. And, and, you know, proof is in the pudding, guys. American League West, uh, believe it or not, I think even though the Angels are really pushing it, their 22-ranked ERA is not going to get them there. Um, 24 ranked bullpen. The rank, I mean, Angels have a lot to go to be competitive this year. Uh, Oakland, they're kind of on the cusp. The 13th ranked ERA, but they have so much dra drama going on in Oakland right now. Are they going to revitalize the stadium? Are they going to do the waterfront? Are they going to move to Vegas? Are they going to move to Portland? Frick, it's just frustrating as hell. Uh, Houston's going to be there, of course. Texas is building. Uh, they win, got, like I said, we talked about earlier what players, Seattle. That 16 ERA, they got to work on that. Uh, they did go get Robbie Ray. Boom. Drop that. And they're ranked number two minor league organization. They could probably trade. And they were kind of like where the Padres were about four years ago, five years ago, with their great minor league organization. They've been able to move to put them themselves in competitive positions. Uh, the National League East. Atlanta's going to be there again. I mean, come on. World Series winner, two time in a row, eight, an NLCS winner. Mets are going to be there again. Um, they're doing great. I mean, but it comes down as, you know, what's DeGrom going to be this year? Uh, but there's, you need uh, players like Lindor and, and McNeil. These guys got a hit, man. So the Mets are going to be fun to watch, but curious to watch because they were a horrible hitting team. Uh, Miami, 11th ERA. Keep an eye on them. Philadelphia is a team I like a lot. Uh, Dave Dabrowski needs to make moves. I mean, he talked about getting pitching outfielding and he didn't get anything when Max was signed. Uh, I mean, what are you looking at? JT behind the plate, Max Verlaine at first, Gene Segura, of course, Alec Baum, Baum at third, and then the young minor league phenom Bryson Stout. He's 27, supposed to be playing for them. Then you got Bryce Harper and Wright. I don't think you're going to have Rojas and Williams or Wilson. Um, I think Ethan Wilson's years away because I don't know. If, is he ready for the big show? So for your for the president of uh, baseball operations to come out and say that I want to focus on those two teams, I'm just hoping that they do and they get something done. Uh, National League Central, you know, again, Milwaukee's got great pitching. St. Louis got great pitching. But when you look at the Cubs and Pittsburgh, you're like, oh, pitching's horrible, man. It's bad. I mean, you can add Marcus Simeon all you want, but your 27th ranked ERA is not going to – break the top nine just on one signing alone uh cincinnati you know great hitting team but again their era is ranked 20th uh, and then you look at the west um everything we talk about in the west dodgers in san francisco first and second ranked eras respectively they're going to be in it uh padres 14th ranked era so the Padres are the question mark like is clevenger healthy is we've talked about that you listen to last week's podcast uh but then colorado and arizona you just stinking it up with your eras man so it's very interesting how it's going to work out. But anyhow, guys, I hope you guys like the podcast. Uh, apologize for any lighting. I'm just learning lighting. Uh, my background, got to work on that. Things are coming along, but this year, 2022, we're going to have a great podcast. Uh, we're going to have guests. Things are going to be going up and up, and we're going to drink on the show. Yeah, some of you guys out there, uh, we're going to, of course, in the beginning of the episode, talk about Little League stuff like that get the under 18 stuff out of the way but towards the rest of the episode why not let's have a couple beers and whatnot um and talk baseball now let's see i have some other things on the list here but i'm not sure i really want to go into it um again the cba again I, what i want you guys to understand is it's very 
very, very diverse. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the CBA. And I'm going to give you guys a little, little taste of it right now. Go down the nerd hole with me. Uh, they're going to be talking about scheduling. Salaries. Salaries is a big section of it because you got salary, salary arbitration in there. Um, expenses and expense allowances. Yeah, you, they get paid food, you know, and, you know, they get a per diems. You know, they get transportation travel expenses, meals and tip allowances, spring training allowances, all-star allowances. They get paid different for all-star and home run derby. Um, termination pay. Uh, again, creation of the pool, uh, players' pool, World Series, Little League Championship, Division, etc. Uh, grievances. That's something they're going to talk about. And the big thing with the discipline. I think the discipline is going to be an interesting dialogue because with the 2017, the social media, I actually have, uh, there was something in here about the social media. And uh, it's very small. It's like... It's just an article addendum to the CBA, and it's just about, hey, how yeah, players have to be respectable. No team can restrict players with the social media. I really think that part of the CBA is going to be a much more dived-in topic this time around uh, because you look at social media in 2017, 2021. I know it's been four years, but, dude, TikTok, everything has come a long way. Again, full circle, back to Trevor Bauer. He was the one doing tons of social media behind the scenes of major league baseball they're going to address that too so that's all part of discipline uh you know and also would players violate the social media i'm just saying that i guess i'm not wording this right i think the social media thing is going to be falling all over the cba a little bit more than just an addendum or an attachment i think it's going to be a big topic of conversation I, it's not a deal breaker i don't think it's going to stop the games from being played i'm just saying it's something uh safe and healthy or safe, safety and health with COVID. This is a huge part, especially our COVID's trending up. But you know what? I think Major League Baseball did it right last year. There wasn't a big amount of COVID issues. There really wasn't uh, in stadiums. I mean, we're packing in stadiums. So I think Major League Baseball is doing well in regards to that. But the safety and healthy is going to be talked about. Disabled list, uh, location of rehab facilities. That's the tough part right now because there's rehab facilities during the off season. So the people that are suffering or the players that are suffering are those players. Because of the lockout, they do not have access to these rehab facilities. So some players are going to be left out. And it's unfortunate. They're just going to have to figure out their strength and conditioning and rehab outside of the, their normal, um, you know, their, their normal uh, access to the stadiums or wherever they have their rehab facilities. Uh, strength and conditioning, spring training conditions. They talk about that. And then you get into miscellaneous, parking, winter league play, uh, future expansions, future uh, sales of clubs, interest rates, boring, um, all-star game. And then it goes, again, there's tons of articles. Uh, players' contracts, the reserve system. We'll get into that one day. Uh, management rights, competitive balance tax. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I'm not that nerdy, right? I don't, I'm not feeling nerdy right now to go down that. Uh, salary. Uh, revenue sharing to do interleague play possible expansion that was part of the article uh, last uh, 2017 in the CBA so it is and then staging of international play events so they're still talking about Mexico and Dominican and in United Kingdom it's this is all stuff that's still on the the table so I mean we got international balls coming and it was coming before COVID. So, God damn it, COVID. You're freaking screwing up everything. But there's, uh, again, there's a ton. Uh, there's home run derby. Like I said, family security, uniform regulations. Uh, there's, and, the, and some of you might be like, well, they don't care. No, there is a drug and alcohol section in here to help players recovery and keep them. Obviously, you know, with players like Josh Hamilton in the past, there's always something there to help players out. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm just focusing on all these different items. There are a lot of stuff in there. Uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse policy. That is what uh, Trevor Bauer is going to be punished under. Um, that is going to be a big focus, especially with him. Uh, use of media, again, ties in the Trevor Bauer. Uh, I think owners push back on it. Players are pushing it, man. And, you know, 
There's a lot of players pushing social media, and I love it. Uh, there's a hazing and bullying section. There really is, and we'll go over that sometime too. But there's just so much on the CBA, and I just want you guys to understand that um, if you get a chance, go go read it, man. I have it on my favorites. I read it almost seriously. I'm in the CBA daily just going, you know, what's this about? I want to understand how my sport operates and why they're locked out. And, you know, honestly, after reading the contracts and looking at or reading the, the contract from 2017, it's it's basic stuff. It's nothing to be, like, worried about with your sport. I think we're going to be fine, guys. I really do. So, anyways, I want to ra- wrap up this podcast. A uh, big thank you from me and Davey Dave for watching the show. Uh, go check out Davey Dave. I'm sorry I didn't give a shout-out to him earlier. He's all over IG. Dude, he's the mean king. Uh he does fabulous memes. He also is very talented and has a lot of other channels. Uh, go check out Davy Dave. But we just want to thank all of you guys for support, all of our podcast listeners for downloading, uh, everyone that supports us on social media. Moving forward, we're going to have these once a week. We're going to have guests. It's going to get better. So please support us. Uh, we check out the link below. We do have, uh, you know, if you could help donate, they'll help us out. I mean, honestly, I just spent. <laughs> Over $1,000 upgrade in my equipment just for this podcast. So, yeah, I need a little bit of cash would be nice. Uh, but as we get money in, I can't always afford it. It's going to grow. We're going to better quality and everything like that. So, anyways, I want to thank you very much for listening to The Ball and Play. This is Sesma signing out. Please follow us on social media. Have a great day. Peace. <laughs>